Hello and welcome to the Canada's Local Gardener podcast. I'm Shauna Doby. I'm the editor of Canada's Local Gardener magazine and I'm here with my mother. Good morning. It's Dorothy Doby here and good to see everybody today. It's the morning or afternoon or night where you are. <laughs> and we're here this week with Kevin Toomey of TNT Seeds. Kevin? Good morning, Shauna. How are you? I'm great. Now, Okay, first things first, tell us a little bit about yourself, Kevin. You work for TNT? TNT Seeds, yes. It was started by my dad and my uncle Mm -hmm. uh, 76 years ago, and I've been there for... 47 years <laughs> and, and more because as as a, a kid or a child growing up we worked there in the summertime and did pack seed and did different things but full-time i've been there 47 years so and wow. your uncle was quite a famous rose grower and a horticulturist himself wasn't he and yes. he made quite a large mark in the united states market right and he, he started out here in winnipeg uh, actually in charleswood uh, breeding gladiolas and that, okay. that was his first passion. Then he got into doing roses. And before that, he was breeding wheat. He was breeding other vegetables as well. But in 1939, he bred a glad here in Winnipeg uh, called Margaret Beaton that he, he named after his grandmother. And his, one of his other brothers was in the uh, St. John's Hobby Mart, and they built a balsa wood box and put a balloon on the bottom of the stem <laughs> and flew it to the 1939 New York World's Fair, and he won first prize. <laughs> thousand dollars back in 1939 wait a second how did he fly it there were in a balloon box no no sorry they put they built a balsa wood box and put a balloon with water on the bottom of it then put it in a plane and oh i understand (laughs) they didn't fly it there they just let it go in and say go to new york okay yes I had an idea they were flying gladiolas too. That's really funny. <laughs> I but didn't, didn't he start it a, properly? Didn't he start a chemical company in the U.S.? Yes, he he started a company called. Uh, Tet, uh, Tetra Chemicals, and it got to be one of the biggest ones in, in the U.S., and then he sold his shares in that before it got to the top, and then he was breeding uh, dwarf wheat in uh, Southern California. Now, anybody who has been getting TNT catalogs, TNT seed catalogs for many, many years will know we're talking about the famous Uncle Jerry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's famous about him? Well, he he also bred four All America Award winning roses. He was the really? first pri- private breeder, other than a company, to breed uh, to win All America rose. So wow! Actually, and and this is all coming to you from Winnipeg. Yes. Yes. One last thing. One last claim to fame. Right now, we're just about to open the most wonderful uh, display or exhibition of uh, Inuit art, and uh, it's it's on it's in the Globe and Mail. Yeah, the largest one in the world, and the collection was started by Uncle Jerry. He, really? he was the largest collector of Esco, Esco art in the world. He had over 6,000 pieces that he huh. sold to the Winnipeg Art Gallery back in 1967. Huh. So there you are. So a very famous guy we've got here on the radio with us this morning. And aside from all of that, this guy knows everything there is to know about planting tomato seeds and any other kind of seed you want to bet. Well, that, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> Now, Kevin, I am about to um, start growing tomatoes. I tried it about 20 years ago. I didn't do very well. I started with a couple of plants that I bought. This year, I've got some tomato seeds that I'm going to grow. And I know all about it. But when it comes to doing it, what am I going to do? Okay, first off, when you're choosing your seeds, you need to make, you know, the first choice you need to make is between determinate and indeterminate. Now, what's the difference? Well, determinate means it only gets to a certain height and stops growing up. Indeterminate means it, it can grow up to two meters or and some of them up to four meters high if you don't pinch the center out of them. So it, it depends on, on your setup and what you're trying to do and how much space you have. Uh-huh. And, the, and the indeterminate keep on, keep on producing, right? Right, but the determinate to keep on producing too t- until frost or till right uh, it gets too cold. Because Mr. Tomato shut. tells me he's had twenty-five foot tomato vines on in good years. Oh yes, depending on the variety, some of them continue to grow. One of our uh, biggest selling variety called Sun Sugar, uh, a small cherry tomato, uh, it'll grow eight to 10, uh, twelve feet high if you let it go. It, mm-hmm. It'll get that wide as well. And it's delicious. These are little tiny tomatoes. The dog used to come and have, like, take little bites. And, and she, we, that was uh, the, um, Sh- or Lori's dog. And she would uh, come and steal the tomatoes off the vine. 
Uh huh. That sounds like Penny, our dog. Yeah. <laughs> so the only difference is that's the only difference. Does it make any difference to your harvest or? Uh, well, the bigger the plant, the more you can get off of it. But then again, they don't always ripen in time. Oh, I see. And a short season, different in a greenhouse, but growing outside. Once August, the nights start to get cool and the days get shorter, they don't produce as much. Right. So it's it's better uh, not if you're growing outside, not to let them get that big because uh, you won't get that much of a, a crop off of it compared okay. to if you pinch it at, a, at say, uh, two meters or a meter and a half, whatever height you want. And then uh, it'll it'll continue to produce below that once you pinch the top off of it. And Kevin, I think people think that they can't, you know, necessarily bring in a, a, a sort of almost not even quite ripe tomato, uh, but you can, right? Oh, yes. Yes. You can bring them in, in, in the fall or late summer and store them in uh, in a cool place. And one of the things that uh, you can do with them as you want them to ripen is put them in newspaper, wrap them in newspaper. And then that keeps the, what they call the ethylene gas in there. And that's what uh, ripens the tomato. Yeah. And you don't do them all at once. Just do a few at a time because you don't want them all to ripen. You want them to keep as long yeah. as you can. I've had that last crop of tomatoes last me for a month or two after the uh, you know snow flies. Yes. And certain varieties will last three or four months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do I need a heating mat? Uh, it's for better. Starting? Yes, it's it's better. You get consistent germination out of it. And uh -huh. one of the things is not to start them too early. A lot of people want to start their tomatoes too early. We don't start ours, our first crop for early sales in the greenhouse. We don't start till the middle of, of March. And right. Then, and then uh, our main crop is uh, the first of April to the first week of April. And that's the ones that are ready to be put out again in uh, Normal time for planting outside is uh, after the 24th of May or the beginning of June, even mm -hmm. all across that, the country. That, yeah, that's one of the things I think makes people wonder. But it is pretty much oh. the rule from coast to coast. Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Even, even in Vancouver and even in uh, lower mainland of BC, they can get a frost up to the middle of, of May as well. Okay, but the average last frost dates uh, for Toronto, it's um, around April 22nd, I think. Right, but you that's can the get, average. But it, you know, you can get cool weather after that, and tomatoes need lots of warm weather to keep growing. They get stunted if they get cool nights, even if it doesn't freeze. Also, that what something people might not recognize is, or realize is that when it's too hot, they don't like that either, right, Kevin? No, no, they won't take the extreme heat. They shut down if it's too cool or if it's too hot. Mm -hmm. So, what's the ideal temperature for to start the seed? Or uh, to, both for growing. For, for starting the seed, the soil temperature should be about 22 degrees uh, Celsius, which is about 74 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And then when you're planting out after the danger of frost, uh, like I said, usually sometimes we can get away with planting the first of May or middle of May here, but lots of times you get a frost before the end of May. And, and even you don't have to get a frost. Sometimes if it's cool and it's windy, it's wind mm -hmm. chill. You still get wind chill. When it's even, you know, when it's above freezing. Oh, well, how do you know that your tomatoes got wind chill? Uh, because they uh, go limp and they go black on, oh, on the edges of the leaves. <laughs> because they die? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh -oh. But all sorts of weird things happen to tomatoes if they don't get the right temperature and if it's not even and so on and so forth. Right. And, Cat and face? Yes, cat tracing, and they don't have enough moisture. It's to give them even moisture all through the growing season. And a lot of times people, they say, well, I watered or it rained last night. Well, it didn't water, it didn't rain on the roots of the tomato, didn't mm -hmm. get enough. And when they're stressed for, for moisture, they take it from the furthest end of the plant, which is the tip of the tomato, and that's where you get blossom end rot. But lots of times it doesn't show up for a month or six weeks later oh really okay. yes it doesn't show up right away it's, it's when the tomato is ripening even when they're green it when it the moisture is pulled back from there then it starts to rot and you don't see it till it's, it's starting to ripen and then the uh, bottom goes all black and the tomato is soft and and then and then you've got to throw it out there's nothing you can do with it or? well you can if if it's ripe enough you can cut off the bottom part but it's uh, a lot of them it, they get too soft and too rotten before they mm -hmm. ripen 
So it's keeping it consistently watered because lots of people think that, well, it's, you know, you should add eggshells and that'll solve the problem, but because it's a calcium issue, but it really is about consistent watering, isn't it? Kevin? Yes. Yes. You can put out, as you said, calcium and calcium supplements or compost in around the tomatoes and that helps it hold more moisture in the ground too. And, and people, when, when they water, especially in, in hot, dry uh, times of the season, should cultivate first so that the water can go down in just light cultivation to break the surface of the of the soil because lots of times after watering it gets hot and dry the surface gets hard and then when you're watering right. most of the water runs away from it instead of down into the roots where you want it what if i have mulch on around my tomato well, that that helps too then it doesn't take it doesn't take as much water okay because it doesn't evaporate or run off okay now going back to the seeds i have yeah. I bought myself a grow grow light. It's this mm-hmm. multi prong thing. It looks kind of cool. Do I need that? Uh, yes, for, for mm-hmm. starting indoors, because uh, all uh, plants need twelve to eighteen hours of daylight. Ooh. Good daylight, and and we're we don't even have uh, twelve hours yet here. But it's not intense. It, the, the sun is low in the morning and low in the late afternoon, so yeah. that's why you need a grow light, and it should be within ten to fifteen centimeters or uh, four, six to eight inches of the plants of the growing tips of the plants. Otherwise, if it's too far away, they keep stretching and reaching for more light. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to get nervous about starting my tomato plants. <laughs> no. <You> know, you, <laughs> I've written about this before and, and, and all the rules. It's like having children, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you may have been a kindergarten teacher or something, but when you have your own, it's completely different. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it changes every year slightly, the growing conditions and the weather and different things. So it's variable. Yes. Okay. Okay. I want to break us up for just a moment so that we can hear from Ian and the 10 neat things. Go ahead, Ian. Here is an excerpt from 10 neat things. Snow on crocuses. If a crocus has been in bloom fully for several days, sudden snow or a heavy rainfall will probably do in the blossom, though the rest of the plant will likely survive. Crocuses have survived their early blooming through the centuries because they close up, protecting the inner flower when there is no sun. And we're back. Um, Okay, so starting my tomato seeds, I also have uh, some little plug trays that came with the heat mat. What else do I need? Uh, well, you start them in the little plug trays, and it's mm-hmm. good to start them in a smaller pot and let them grow up and get to, to about uh, you know 10 to 12 centimeters higher, 6 to 8 inches, and then put them into a bigger pot, uh, at least a 3 or 4 inch uh, pot, and you plant them down. When, when you transplant them, you take the, the bottom leaves off and you plant it as deep as you can in the pot because then it, the, it'll root all along the stem. The more stem, the more roots you have, the better the plant is and it, it's better adapted to taking up more moisture when you plant it outside. Okay, I have two questions. One is, I've never quite understood this. Why do I have to change to a bigger pot? Why can't I just start out in a bigger pot? Well, because you're planting it down. Once it's started, then you take it and plant it down at the bottom of the bigger pot, and you get a better, a better root system. You okay. can leave it in the same size pot, and it'll grow, but it does better if you at least transplant it once and plant it down. When you take it out of the small pot, mm-hmm. the soil level, you, you're planting that down another three or four inches into the the bigger pot okay so, so, so how many get, le- go ahead you get a lot more roots along the stem and, and it produces and uh faster yeah so i think that's something people don't really uh, think about when they're transplanting their tomatoes that they should plant it up to its neck is what you usually say kev right exactly so and, just two leaves sticking out the top yes that's fine and it'll continue to grow and then the stem will be much thicker yeah and stronger and okay. better at taking up water. Right, because it has, uh, you know, four times the root system as it does if you don't transplant it. I, I do get a little bit squeamish about pl- um, burying leaves when I'm planting things. So this no, is going to take... You you pinch off the leaves. Okay, pinching off pinch the leaves. Pinch off the bottoms of the stems uh, to the soil level. Uh-huh. And it'll it'll produce more. As long as it's got two leaves on it, it'll, it'll grow quickly and produce more leaves. Okay, because last be a- year... 
last year I grew potatoes and I would always feel kind of bad um, hilling them up inside, well, inside a little grow bag. Yes. But it's the same pro- because of the same uh, family. Right. And it's the same kind of idea because the potatoes put the nodules out at the new roots, which they grow up as you hill the, hill the uh, plant. Yeah. You get more production. And yeah. the same, same with tomatoes if you plant them down deeper. And sometimes when you plant them out into the garden, you do it again. When mm-hmm. it comes out of the, when it, in a, like a four inch peat pot, you bury the whole thing. You make sure that if you're using peat pots, you make sure they're soaking wet before you transplant them. And then you plant them down on the ground and then they, uh, they will take up the moisture. But if they go and dry, they get hard and it's hard to get enough moisture to soften them up again and for the roots to go through the peat moss. Right. Peat pot. Yes. Now I was just going to use yogurt containers. Yes, you, you can do that. Yeah. And then, but then when you take them out, when you transplant, you take them out of the container. The mm-hmm. same thing, you plant it down deeper in the soil, as deep as you, you can go. Just leaving two leaves at the top. Well, you, with the bigger plants, you leave more than that. You plant it down about uh, 8 to 10 inches, so, you know, about 25 wow. centimeters. And again, oh. it'll it'll uh, uh, root all along the stem again, get better production. And you have roots to start with further down where there's more moisture. Okay. I'm getting she's confused. getting a lot of <laughs> she's got a lot to think about here Ken. Yes. but that's that's important because there are a lot of new gardeners now who haven't tried these things right mm-hmm. exactly mm-hmm. And, yes and, i see a lot of questions on facebook oh yes well the thing is that i learn something new every day and every, mm-hmm. and every year gardening i do things slightly different you've got to do your own sort of trials and, and errors and find the best method for you and, and what you're happy with and mm-hmm. what what you're successful with because it doesn't matter what method you use there's all kinds there, there's certain things that can go wrong or problems and you you think you did something wrong and get discouraged and don't want to do it again it's kind of like being playing with a computer where when you're first were learning and you something went wrong you thought it was your fault same yes. thing with plants <laughs> right okay yes okay now when it comes to watering with the seedlings Everybody says you have to spray them. Why do I have to spray them? Why can't I just sort of trickle water onto them with my hands or something like that? We water, water them very gently. We water them over the top mm-hmm. and, and the, to get the moisture down into the roots. Now, something very important is fertilization or feeding them. And from the beginning, we uh, feed them with a uh, 10 17 fertilizer. and mixed 10 17 And mixed with seaweed. And because seaweed has all the minor elements and micronutrients, uh-huh. and the 105217 promotes root growth. The, ten, the first number is nitrogen, and that promotes top growth. And then it's phosphorus and potash, the second mm-hmm. two numbers, and they are for root development. Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure that the plants are good and healthy when for growing all the time. Uh, my, my uncle's favorite saying was, you wanted the, the leaves of the John Deere green. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> on all tomatoes. On all tomatoes. Okay. And so John that's Deere an important Green. part is, is to keep them well fed. And again, if they're well fed, they don't stretch and, and mm-hmm. uh, grow too fast. So a lot of people use 20, 20, 20 fertilizer, but there's too much nitrogen in there and they grow too fast and don't get the root development. And you and get too many leaves and not enough support for the fruit that you want later. Yes. The first time I grew tomatoes, the the skins were very thick, and I was wondering if it was just the kind of variety, or was it I it, wasn't feeding them? It or? can be the, the variety and not enough water, especially yeah, that's when they're ripening, it. you know. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, it, it, the same uh, principle applies for apples or crab apples or things. When the the fruit is setting, you've got to give them a lot more water to get the fruit to size up and the sweetness and the tenderness of them. Oh, okay. So for tomatoes as well, they need lots so, more water. Okay. So can I start? Oh, it, I went and bought some potting soil or yeah. seed starting soil. Mm-hmm. Would it really be so bad if I just used, you know, soil from the garden or whatever I had hanging around? Well, the soil from the garden gets too heavy. Mm-hmm. And, and it gets too thick and you don't get enough air in it into it for them mm-hmm. to develop and get the roots up. And a lot of times the soil, if it dries out, the soil from the garden, it gets hard. And it's hard to get it uh, moist again, to take up enough moisture, especially when, when you're doing small plants. Oh, okay. So that's you- the, uh, what about um, potting soil? Uh, yes, pot, you can use potting soil or seed starting soil. Oh, seed starting soil a- is just finer. 
ground yeah, up. It has a lot of organics in it too. So that's the difference. Most of your outside soil doesn't necessarily have as much of that organic material. It helps keep it dry and it helps keep it wet and also keeps the air in the, in amongst the roots, which is really important. <laughs> right. Garden soil compacts too much especially in small spaces and especially when it's going from moist to dry over and over again. Okay. So it was 10, 52, 17? 17. Yes. We call it our rose and strawberry fertilizer, but we use it on everything. We use it in our greenhouse all year. And so I, I do that on the seedlings. Yes. Right from the, the seaweed. And the seaweed. Yes, mix the two together, and you put it over. You water from that from the beginning till you transplant, and you do it twice after you transplant them out in the garden. Oh, okay. So you don't do it every time. Uh, yes. Yeah, you do it at the right level. You can do it, and you're watering all along. Like ten percent. <laughs> yes. Strength. Ten yes. percent strength. Right. Like a, a tablespoon or an ounce to a gallon. And uh, five milliliter, five milliliters per liter, and again you can water them with that all the way through. Boy, they. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, I started uh, some flower seeds about twenty years ago as well, and I ne they never came to anything because I experienced damping off. Right. Uh, that uh, is a problem where it's moist and cool around the stem, around the uh, right at the soil level, mm -hmm. and you get funguses forming. And that's why lots of times, like you said, with a heat mat, you keep the soil warm. And as long as it's not too wet, you don't have a problem with damping off. But if you do, you can use a product called uh, Plant Wash Plus. Which Plant is, Wash Plus. Which is Aquaton, which will help uh, stop the, the fungus from forming. And uh, you can use a sulfur product. There used to be a product called No Damp, but it, it was taken off the market 10 years ago. So now. So if I get damping off, it's not game over? Nope. Well, I mean, it is for the. Well, <laughs> it, it, it is. It, if it gets really bad, it'll kill the plant because what it does is it rots the st right at the, the ground level and then it can't take up moisture. Okay. So, so how do I know that. I'm about to get damping off. You'll see that the uh, leaves in the plant starting to go uh, paler green or almost mm -hmm. lime green. And if you look at right at the soil level, you can see where, where the stem is starting to get black or hard. Uh -huh. And and that's uh, the mold setting in. Okay. And they need good air circulation. You know, I meant so that the air is moving around, not what it's not staying damp and wet. Yeah, I was it's allowed to dry out. Yes, between waterings. This sounds like more trouble than it's worth. No. <laughs> <laughs> it just—it's just the detail because once you're doing it, it comes naturally. And, and some years you get damping off, some years you don't. That's why I say every year is a different growing year, different conditions. Even though it's the same time, you say the weather's the same, or you know, but uh, slight changes can make a big difference sometimes. Do you ever get damping off if you direct seed? I mean, not tomatoes, but something else? Uh, not usually, but it can if it's really wet and cold. You know, okay. And again, putting things in the garden too early, even seeds can rot in the ground and rot so coming that, okay. out of the ground. That would be something that they might have trouble with in the um, Maritimes. or Yes. You but, can have trouble with it anywhere, though. And, and I know people who say that they just don't plant until after the 24th of May. And in places like this, not until the first week in June, in places that are colder. Well, I have an article going into our next issue that it's all about. You don't have to wait for May 24th. So I'm going to have to revisit that. Well, no, <laughs> You don't for flowers. Take your for, chances. For a lot of different flowers and such. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like I said, take your chances. We have people that, you know, plant the end of April here. But lots mm -hmm. of times they come back by the end of May and get more plants because they lost it with frost. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and you can do use cozy coats and things like that to get some out earlier, get a head start. Uh -huh. But again, it, de it depends on the year and how the growing conditions go. We, we've had very cold, damp Junes where everything just sits there. You know, it's uh -huh. almost stunted. So it, that's what I'm saying. Every year can be different. Okay. 
so supposing we get to May. <laughs> <laughs> you will. <laughs> and I have some healthy tomato plants. What do I do? Okay, you're going to put them in a container. You're going to mm -hmm. grow them in a container. Okay, mm -hmm. make sure the container is big enough for the type of plant you bought. It. If you're growing, if it's a big plant or a staking plant or indeterminate, you want to make sure it's at least like a five-gallon pail or, or bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing with containers is they grow faster because the soil is above the ground, so it's warmer and stays warmer. But that also takes more water. So it's got to be watered more. And when, when you put it in the container, you just water the soil. You don't water over the, the plant. You don't have to water over the plant. Right. You want to water the soil. And it's best, like I said, to water them if it's really hot. And, and if you're in an area where it's windy, because, again, the wind takes the moisture out of the plant quickly. So that's why you have to water two or three times a day. Really? Yes. A good watering in the morning, first thing in the morning. Like a lot of people off to work, they water first thing in the morning. And then as soon as they get home at night mm -hmm. or the afternoon or whatever, give them an, another watering. Kevin, I've heard that you water the plant, not the soil. Is that a good saying? Well, I, I believe in watering the soil on the okay. plants. Yeah, rather than... Uh, it, oh, you water the, the soil, garden. not the plant. Yeah. Yeah. And if you get some water on the plant, it doesn't hurt it because they get rain on them all the time. But Yeah, I I'm thinking about seedlings, not... not right. There's uh, no seedlings. No, I, I, I water the soil Okay. more than anything. Right. That's good and again, to know. Yes. You try to. And like I said, if you get some on the plant, it's not, it doesn't hurt it. Just just Shauna like, was asking about the misting because a lot of people suggest that you should mist your seedlings. Well, the problem with misting is you don't get enough moisture in the soil sometimes. That's what I thought. Yes. So it's a balance of, of how do you say, the right moisture in the soil without them being too wet and without them being too dry. But it's just it's trial and error. You know? Are tomatoes harder than any other vegetable to grow? No. No. <laughs> so they're all this difficult to get started? <laughs> well, yeah. If you want the early tomatoes and the real good ones, but lots of people in the garden, even my garden, I don't get all my tomatoes picked. And next year I get tomato plants coming up everywhere, just you know, in the garden. But lots of times if you leave them, they don't necessarily ripen because they're four to six weeks behind what you're starting inside. Right. I know, and that's probably hard to believe, but we actually will have even petunias will come back and self sow sometimes yes. under the right conditions. Yes, for really? sure. Yes. So they're not, uh, the, the seeds aren't the problem. No. With the no. frost. No. Mm. No. Well, it depends on the conditions. Yeah. And, and, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, but they're more temperate plants than they are tropical, I would say. Wouldn't you, Kevin? Yes. Yes. No, oh, I did not know that about uh, petunias. Well, they're all the same family, petunias, potatoes, tomatoes, <laughs> all the same nightshade family. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We've got to take another break. Going green this year? Make the most of it with a subscription to Canada's local gardener magazine. Turn your gardening visions into the real thing. Visit localgardener.net and let the glowing begin. And we're back. All right. My tomatoes are now in my garden or in my pots growing. Yes. And I water them twice a day. When it's when it's really hot and dry, and you okay. know, and lots of times people say, "Well, it rained," but unless you get a good rain that soaks the soil, mm -hmm. you've got to be mindful that you still have to water them sometimes, some days, even after a rain. If it's if it's in the garden instead of in a pot, does it have to be watered twice a day? Uh, it should, again, if it's hot and windy, you know, when, when you're, you're getting in the 90s and strong winds and especially dry winds because it mm -hmm. takes the moisture out of the plant. And that's what causes blossom and rot is the moisture is leaving the plant faster than the roots can take it up. And if the roots are stressing for moisture, they can't bring up as much. Mm -hmm. Kevin, I... Um, I put coir or coir, whichever yeah. you want to say it, the cocoa hull in, uh, mix it in with the soil. It helps to keep that watering uh, necessity a little bit down, but right. you know, don't use too much. But it certainly 
prevents you having to water twice a day in, in most days. Right. And, and, in my pots. In your pots, because it, yeah. it has enough moisture in there. And that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, in, in, when you do it in containers, you should put some extra either compost or like core and others or gel, wetting gel in there to hold moisture. So mm -hmm. th there's okay. enough for it. How moist should it be? Should it always, um, should you always have moist soil? You should have moist damp. Is, yeah. yeah, damp. Damp. <laughs> damp soil. Yes. Yes. And and again, if, if you get cool days and you don't have to water as often, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you get three or four days or a week that's cool, you can just water once a day. You don't have to give near as much water. But when it's hot and, and especially warm nights, mm -hmm. when you get the warm nights, then you've got to water okay. at least twice a day. In Toronto in here, yeah. nights are always warm. They're always yes. quite warm. Right. Um, and the days are mostly hot as well. Yeah. And you have high humidity, mostly. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, but but if you're in Alberta, it's a very different thing. It's very dry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it can get quite cool. They were very sharp change in temperature uh, yeah. during the day. Yes, and cool nights, and like I said, the the humidity level. If if you have high humidity, you don't need to. It doesn't need as much water because the plant doesn't evaporate as much. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but when it's dry, it, it gives off a lot of water when it's trying to grow and pushing to grow. So okay. When will I get my first tomatoes? Depending on the variety, yeah. you put them out the end of May, you know, roughly the middle of May mm -hmm. to the end of May, you should have some by the end of June. Oh, really? If not earlier, yes. Mm -hmm. Depending, Depending on the variety, yeah. Yes. What, which one is the earliest? Well, the, the Prairie Pride, the one we have that was developed here at the University of Manitoba is a bush tomato, and that's the earliest one that we have. And then there's another one called Bush Early Girl that uh, is very early. Centennial Rocket is another one. They're small, little, almost uh, a little bigger than a paste tomato, but they, they'll produce, you'll have them in June. By the middle of June, you'll have tomatoes. But these are all very small, right? Cherry type tomatoes? Uh, no, it's Prairie Pride is. But uh, sorry, Prairie Pride is a, a full size tomato for a six ounce to eight ounce tomato. And mm -hmm. uh, Centennial Rocket is a three to four ounce tomato. Wow. Okay. And then your beefsteak, your bigger ones, will be in July, mm -hmm. by the middle of July till, uh, and on. So. Okay, so before we talk about all the things that can still go wrong, <laughs> let's talk about varieties uh, yes. as we've been doing. There are cherry tomatoes. Uh, paste tomato is like a Roma. Right. It's a little bit, it's uh, about the size of. Oval shaped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else is, and there's beefsteak, which is the big, big one. Yes. And then there's uh, well, there's one called ox heart again, a different shape with a with a shape of a, of a heart, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's very large. But there's uh, the the bush type uh, generally are a little smaller than the staking type. But again, depends on variety. Uh, now hold on, is bush type is that a determinate and staking type is indeterminate? Uh, yes, determinate. Okay. Uh, yeah, bush is the determinate type, and uh, there's lots of good tomatoes now out there. One called Primo Red that uh, produces uh, huge quantities of large tomatoes mm -hmm. and consistently. So now we're talking all the ones we've been talking about or that you've named are red. Is that correct? Yes. Well, other than uh, we talked earlier about the one called Sun Sugar, that's a yellow tomato mm -hmm. and uh, that it's a yellow cherry tomato and the yellows don't sell as well. And in our garden center, uh, we started pushing Sun Sugar about seven, eight years ago, and now it's our biggest selling tomato in our, our garden center because it's the only place they can get them. Nobody else grows them. It's and, very sweet. Yes, very, very sweet. sweet tomato. Yeah. And, and we sell over 3,000 like yeah, 3, plants a year of that one tomato. They come from all over to get it because at times you can have two to 400 tomatoes on it at a time. Wow. Uh, and do you, do you still have seeds for that? Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> and my and my garden at home, I always plant one right near the beginning of my garden. When I come home from work, I walk mm -hmm. out to the garden and grab a handful of sun sugar and then walk around the garden and decide what I got to do first that day. So. 
<laughs> so you garden at home as well as oh, at work? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Oh I have goodness. a big garden at home. But he always gets his garden at home in late, from what I hear. Yes, I, I never planned out till after May 15th or uh, June 15th because we're too busy at the garden center. Right. But, but my tomatoes and, other, and my peppers catch up to all the neighbors. How and come? pass them. Well, because you're he's a good them? gardener. <laughs> I talk to them nicely. <laughs> because you feed them 50... 10, 50, 2, 17. 10, 50, 2, 17. Yep. And, yes. yep. and he talks to them. And I talk to them. <laughs> yeah. They need to know they're loved. Yes. What about green tomatoes and striped tomatoes and all those crazy, uh, like heirloomy type tomatoes? It's a preference what you want to do. If you like them green, some people love green tomatoes. They're a little firmer. They're not as juicy and not as sweet. Oh, and, really? Even and, when they're ripe? Yes. And it's a... Uh, uh, I mind thing because when you're trying to eat a green tomato, it doesn't look like a tomato, mm -hmm. so you think it doesn't taste like a tomato. Mm -hmm. What it does, it, it's but just not as sweet. Mm -hmm. And and they're you fry them, don't you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fried green tomatoes. Yes, <laughs> they're good for pickling and they're good for frying and things like that. So it just again your preference. A lot of people now with all these gardening shows and. Uh, uh, cooking shows, sorry, and everything. People are trying different things in the garden, getting different ideas and trying, you know, all kinds of, of different tomato sizes, shapes, you know, just, just for the fun of it. When you get into it, it becomes your hobby. Mm -hmm. You always vary quite a bit. Do yeah, different I, things. I know there are, there are people on the internet selling seeds that uh, they'll have you know, a hundred different varieties of tomatoes. Oh, yes. It's, it's become a little bit crazy. Well, there's over 2,000 varieties of tomatoes mm -hmm. in the world. So, I mean, it's, you know, there's all kinds out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess I have to ask, <laughs> what else can go wrong when I grow tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> As long uh -huh. as you, uh, the weather cooperates and works with you, and as long mm -hmm. as you stay ahead of them, there, there isn't that much problem. There, there's well, problems later on with blight. <laughs> yeah. Blight, yes. Blight. With yes. early blight okay. and late blight. Tell oh, us blight. the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, well, the early blight, all of them are airborne. Right? A lot of people, and, and it helps, like I said, to plant mm -hmm. your tomatoes in a different part of your garden every year. And in the container, you're changing the soil. So, But, but blight is airborne, and it's blown mm -hmm. around, and it, it's mainly from potatoes, but it can come from other things, the fungus, and then once it sets in. But if your plants are stressed or aren't healthy, they're more susceptible to it, and it spreads quicker. Mm hmm but if you, if you keep the plants healthy and feed them regularly, the healthier they are, the less chance of them getting blight. Show, tell us what blight looks like, Kev. Uh, it starts by little spots, uh, usually on the bottom of the leaves close to the, the soil, because that's usually where it's cool and damp. Ye yellow but, spots or black spots? Well, or? they can be either black or yellow spots, but then they spread and mm -hmm. go and, and uh, cover the entire leaf. And sometimes mm -hmm. when you see uh, blight, these little black spots are they're almost orange. At the beginning, you can pick the leaves off, it, and that helps to control it as well. Mm -hmm. And again, you, you can spray your plants with a, a product called Plant Wash Plus or uh, sulfur uh, or copper spray. And, and that helps to prevent it. If you want it to be uh, like organic, what would then, you use? Uh, sulfur. You mm -hmm. can use liquid sulfur or copper. What and, about and the baking soda thing? You, you can use baking soda too, but the trouble is if, if you don't mix it right, it'll burn. Yeah. It makes it too strong. So How about hydrogen soda. peroxide? And hydrogen peroxide works well, too. At a 3% level of hydrogen peroxide, that's what they sell in, in uh, most pharmacies. So you use straight? or? Yes. At that, you can mix it in water and spray it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the hydrogen much? peroxide helps, helps them to grow, too, because it feeds the plant. Oh. More oxygen in it. How much hydrogen peroxide to, uh, say, a liter of water? Uh, you would put, uh, in a liter of water, you would put uh, 25 to 50 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. Okay. It's one to two ounces to a liter. Okay. So then there's the bad one, the, the late blight. Oh. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, oh, we deflated her completely. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> I thought I could get through all this. Yeah, what about late? You can't. You can't. Again, <laughs> it, it, it depends on the year, how bad it is, the growing conditions. But I meant that it's the same as early blight. If you keep your plants healthy, once you start to see, like if you start spraying regularly with hydrogen peroxide or plant wash plus or copper spray, but uh it should control it. But again, if, if you see it, you start picking off some of the leaves before it spreads to the whole plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's uh, conditions related. You don't usually get it as bad in container plants as you do growing in the garden. Oh, okay. But because... I've had it happen overnight. Oh, yes, yes. And it, your it, plant, your, your everything's looking wonderful. The tomatoes are nice and juicy. And everything looks perfect for picking in a few days and boom, it's done. Yeah. It can hit but, you really hard. And depends on varieties. Some varieties are more susceptible to blight than others. Mm -hmm. So especially the heirloom varieties, some of the older varieties, they don't have much disease resistance in them. So yeah. it's usually around, you usually hear about it being in the in the potato fields or something like that, though, don't you, Clev, before? Yes, yes. And they're spraying for blight in the potatoes all the time. Then you should use a round. sort of yes. preventative, like Kevin's suggesting. Yeah, so keep them healthy and yeah, it doesn't get as bad. But it, again, some years there is no blight, so it's you know. So does does this blight and everything? It, it does it affect the fruit or just the leaves? Well, it affects. I mean, the, if it, if there's already tomatoes on it, can you use those tomatoes? As long as it doesn't take the whole plant down. If you don't try and control it, then the whole plant will be taken over by blight, and then it can't. Uh, uh, feed the the tomatoes, but you can right. still take the tomatoes off of there and ripen them on their own. They, they it doesn't affect the tomato; they don't okay. go bad. What about tomato hornworm? Oh, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> At least I we don't get that many of them here in Manitoba, no. but when we do, no. it's a thrill. Yes, it's a thrill, is it? <laughs> well, because they take the odd they're tomato. <laughs> yeah. No, they're amazing. They yeah. take the odd tomato, but then you get this absolutely amazing butter butterfly moth from it, yeah. the uh, sphinx moth, mm -hmm. just like a little like a little hummingbird playing around in your flowers in the later part of the day. So as it's worth you, having losing a tomato or two. Yeah, as long as you don't have too many. Yeah, but. Again, problem you can have problems with aphids or white flies or mm -hmm. they said hornworms. And the one thing that uh, we use is uh, diatomaceous earth. It comes in oh, different okay. forms. It's called it. We sell it as insect stop. Uh, there's a couple other on the market, and it, it's actually organic. It's not poisonous. Mm -hmm. What it is is ground up fossils. It's mm -hmm. very sharp, and as the insects crawl over it, it cuts them and it de dehydrates them. Yeah. And, and it tears it, them to shreds. Yes. <laughs> it works for slugs. Slugs are another problem in the yeah. garden. You don't have it in containers, but again, diatomaceous earth <laughs> works on, on slugs as well. But one of the things about diatomaceous earth is you have to um, replenish it all the time. Well, it, it doesn't get washed unless you get a heavy rain. It doesn't get washed out right away. You mm -hmm. can actually mix it in water and spray it on that way because it's, it's hard sometimes to dust the plants and, and all over with it. But when you put, mix it in water and spray it on, again, it's a tablespoon or uh, 25 milliliters to a, a gallon or five milliliters to a liter of water, and you can spray it on the plants. Will that keep aphids down, Kev? Yes, it will. Aphids and white flies. Oh, mm -hmm. isn't yeah. there another product that keeps aphids down too? That uh, it, you know is a, is a root product, root feeder. Uh, what not? No, not with uh, uh, vegetables. No, with vegetables. Couple, okay. not, not with vegetables. And again, you can use inse insecticidal soaps by Safer's uh, product, which is good. But any of the insecticidal soaps are contact sprays. So if you spray the the plant, it only gets the insects that you spray. It's it's not toxic to them afterwards. Mm -hmm. When it dries on the plant, it doesn't bother them. You know what? I have um, uh, sweet potato vines Vine, yes. growing inside right now. I, they just came out of my sweet potatoes, so I decided <laughs> they're in water, and all of a sudden they've got aphids. Yes. Inside in the yes. winter, what's going on? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it seems crazy to me. Yes, but aphids. A uh, fellow in Lethbridge told me this years ago, Mike Stefancic, who's a mm -hmm. bonsai grower. He said, if aphids didn't have natural predators, said in one year the world would, the entire world would be covered eight feet deep in aphids. 
I believe it. Yeah, I've I've, I've seen the the different um, numbers that come from one aphid, aphid yes. throughout its lifetime, throughout a season. But you yes. can just wash your vines now, can't you? That's all yes. I've been aphids, doing. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, and yeah, with a little bit I've of soap, like I said, a little bit of soap and, and just wash it lightly and, and then that will get rid of them. Yeah. Kevin gave me some sweet potato slips last year. And here in the prairies, it's not that easy to grow sweet potatoes. Tell us how you did, Kevin. You did better than I did. I, I grew some at home. And uh, in the end, I didn't get mine in again till almost the end of June. But uh, I've got uh, sweet uh, sweet potatoes that were oh, 10 to 12 centimeters long and uh, about four, four centimeters across. And I really enjoyed them. I put them in with my mashed potatoes <laughs> that I had for Thanksgiving. I mixed them in with the mashed potatoes and gave a very good flavor. Did you now, preheat the soil at all? Uh, yes, I yeah. did. But uh, I should have got them in earlier. They need mm -hmm. a longer period of time. And in fact, we just got uh, 2,000 pounds of sweet potatoes in yesterday from uh, a supplier in, in the U.S. And for our right? sweet potatoes this year that we're growing, we grew and sold about 30,000 sweet potato slips last year. We're oh, hoping to good. do 100,000 this year. Well, so you have lots of them available yes. for people right now? Uh, no, not not yet. They won't be available till the end of April, beginning of May. But you will have them. Yes, yes. You don't want them right now, anyhow. If they're no. if they're already slips, right? Yes. Yeah. No, no. Okay. You want the later on. Yeah. We're getting way off topic, but this is a <laughs> <Nope>. good spot. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. This is a good spot to stop and hear from our friends at our head office again. The snow is melting. The earth is thawing. Spring is here. Time to get your gardening skills in action. Subscribe to Canada's Local Gardener and let the growing begin. Go to localgardener.net to find out more. And we're back for our final uh, bit of talk with Kevin Toomey. We've got our tomatoes. We managed to get through blight aphids, early blight, late blight, get the <laughs> seeds started, everything else. And I have a tomato. Do I let it ripen on the vine? Uh, yes. You, mm -hmm. It's best to let them ripen on the vine. And especially, you know, in the early part of the season, because you get much more flavor with them. And really? The, the, yes. And the thing is that there's many uses for tomatoes. So if you get too many at once, you could always freeze them and use them in the wintertime. You just wash them off and you can either freeze them whole or slice them up or, mm -hmm. you know, in quarters or whatever and put them in freezer bags and then use them in soups or stews or anything through the winter. So because people... Some people try to eat all the tomatoes they grow at once, and then they get sick of them and give up at the end. <laughs> so, and and when you freeze them, do you wash them first? Yes, wash them first, and yeah. that's all you have to do. You don't have to blanch them. You can if you, you blanch, do you take you take the skin off, but there's most of the nutrients are in the skin. Mm -hmm. Ian makes sauce, and he's got, he's always telling me, "Would you like some tomato sauce?" <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> I would. He can send it to me. <laughs> Well, when you grow your own tomatoes or, and freeze them or your own sauce, there's so much more flavor in them. And there's pride. They always taste better when you grew it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you enjoy it. And through the winter, you enjoy the fruits of your labor. And then you get excited about spring. We we had the uh, opening the mail yesterday at, at work. We had about 150 orders. And, and one of them had a nice heart-shaped note on it and said sorry for the mess in the order form but I'm so excited for spring <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are this year yeah. yes uh, but yeah. now I've got to say I have read that you don't need to ripen tomatoes outdoors that it I've read not experienced that it doesn't make a difference it, it does in the flavor yeah. uh, and again depending on the varieties again uh a lot of the varieties that they sell in, in the stores, in the big box stores, and what they make uh, juice and, and uh, paste out of, there, there is not much flavor to them because yeah. they want them to be able to store and they want to be able to ship them. Mm -hmm. So, but the homegrown tomatoes are softer. They don't keep as well. They don't last as long. Mm -hmm. And again, you can pick them off at any time if you want to ripe them in, inside. Mm -hmm. But 
it's to keep the conditions and not do them all at the same time because you don't want them all ripening at the same time. Same yeah. thing in, in the fall. You can pick, you know, you could pick up the 50 pounds of tomatoes mm-hmm. left out on the on the vines or your plants and bring them inside. But you want to put them in a cool place and dark. And then as you want to ripen them, you take them out. And like I said, if you wrap them in newspaper for a day or two, it keeps the ethylene gas around them. And that's what ripens them. That's how they ripen them right. in the in the stores, in the transportation system that they uh, pump ethylene gas in the trailers or, or the cold storage for them to ripen them. Okay. All right. One more question. <laughs> yeah. ha- have you heard of rhizotomato or rhizotomat? No. It's, it's um okay. Then I get to tell you about something. Okay. It's See, cluster- I learn something new every day. <laughs> it's a clustered tomato. It's available at just a few places across Canada. And when I saw it, I was just amazed. Um, it it kind of looks like a bunch of grapes, but they're they're all combined on the inside into one tomato. Right. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've just got to tell you, but I was going to ask you yeah. if you'd ever had it no. and how it actually tastes. No, I've never tried it. Sounds kind of awful. <laughs> well, now, 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 you know, and now you've got something new to grow this year. Right. I've got to look for it. When I get back it's, to uh, work after this, I'm going to go look it up right away. <laughs> it's called Reise Tomat. Uh, like the German, you know, Reise, right. R-E-I-S-E. Um, okay. Well, then I, I'm glad I, I could See. inform you of something. No. Okay. I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Kevin, Kevin, for many years, I did a radio show, as you know, and Kevin was my host, mm-hmm. uh, who my backup host, and uh, was very, very popular here. So I hope he'll come back and talk to us about other things because he knows everything that goes on in the garden. Sure. Well, I'd like gonna, to come back. <laughs> I'll have to put you on my speed dial. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, uh, the, more nervous than I was before about starting my no, tomatoes no. now. Don't be. Don't be. Mother Nature is on your side. She will help you. <laughs> it doesn't sound like she's on my side. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kevin, for being here. Um, I also want to thank the Government of Canada for the funding that makes this possible. And as always, thank you, Mum. You're very welcome. Always glad to be here. (laughs) And I look forward to talking to everybody again. All right. Next time. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. 